I, I'm like Ed Stegall, who used to preach for the Woodland Oaks congregation. He preaches for the Monroe, uh, West Monroe, Jackson, or the Jackson Street Congregation, West Monroe, Louisiana, that if it wasn't for the book of Romans, I probably wouldn't stay a Christian. And the reason is, is because Romans remapped me, so to speak. Uh, Romans told me what I needed to hear a long time ago and what a lot of people need to hear. And what we're going to keep hearing tonight is, how many are sinners? All of us are sinners. So we, we said at the outset of this that chapter 1 through 15, chapters, chapter 1, 1 to 15 is the introduction. We didn't handle it that way because there was so much good meat in chapter 1, 1 to 7 that we thought we better split it between that and chapter one, verse eight to 15. And then you come to the section one of the book, which starts. And section one is, first of all, the theme of the gospel, theme of this book. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. It is written that just by his faith shall live. That's the theme of the book. That's the first revelation that we've got. That is the gospel is being revealed. The second thing is the wrath of God is being revealed. And, and he spends quite a bit of time in the last part of chapter one describing those things that a student asked me yesterday if I thought homosexuality and lesbianism was right. And I said, no. And he says, he said, well, how do you figure that? And I said, because God says it's not right. And I just quoted to him or was talking to him about 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10. Well, he just wanted to be a class clown, so he started screaming a little bit and, and went on. We looked at the first part of chapter 2, and the idea here is that the Gentiles who don't have the law are condemned without it. Because the law leads us up to the perfect law of liberty. And so Paul spent quite a bit of time in chapter 2 telling about the righteous judgment of God. And we don't like to talk about judgment. We don't like to talk about punishment. We'd like to talk about what we talk about on Sunday nights. We, we like to talk about Paul's love letter. And we like to talk about the good things. We like to talk about the nice things. In fact, we, we, we're kind of like Paul in Philippians 4, 8, you know, think on those things. Verse 9, think on, meditate on those things. And so we don't like to talk about responsibility and accountability and judgment. Well, Paul says it's happening to the Gentiles, lest you think it only happens to the Gentiles. We better get serious that it's happening to the Jews because the Jews are condemned with the law. Now, here's why they're condemned. And the book of Hebrews sheds a lot of light on this. The book of Hebrews reminds us that there is absolutely no forgiveness of sins under the law of Moses. None. In fact, chapter 10, first four verses said, if the blood of bulls and goats and the sprinkling of, an, of the ashes of a heifer could take away sin, well, what do we need Jesus for? And if I stood and said to anybody that is Christianity-oriented, or if I said to anybody that, that believes in, in the Bible and God, and I said, well, let's just do away with Jesus tonight, I, I'm sure I would hear about it. <laughs> because... You can't have salvation. You can't have the forgiveness of sins without Jesus Christ. But under the law of Moses, Jesus couldn't be the Savior. Jesus couldn't be the high priest. Jesus couldn't be the Messiah because he's not of the tribe of Levi. He's of the tribe of Judah. That's the kingly tribe. And so Hebrews chapter 8 says there needed to be a change. And so the law was changed from the old law, which brought bondage, to what James describes in James 1.27, and that is the perfect law of liberty. 
And so how many are under the penalty of sin? Everybody, which makes no room for Sister Bertha's better than you, as we talked about my aunt and the Mississippi Squirrel Revival, Ray Stevens. And I know of some church members that are Sister Bertha better than you. And they can't figure out why the Lord tries to humble them. Well, <laughs> it's because you're not even better than anybody else. I'm not even better than anybody else. Just because I have a different responsibility, just because I have a different title, just because I'm, I do a different a role, does not make me any better than anybody else. And so now tonight, we're going to come to chapter 3, verse 1. So Paul asked the question, Paul, what advantage then has the Jew or what is the profit of circumcision? Much in every way, chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God. For what if some did not believe? Will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? Certainly not. Indeed, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it's written, that you may be justified in your words and you may overcome when you are judged. How will God judge the world? But if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unjust who inflicts wrath? I speak as a man. Certainly not. For then how will God judge the world? For if the truth of God is increased through my lie to his glory, why am I also still judged as a sinner? And why not say, let us do evil that good may come, as we are slanderously reported? And as some affirm that we say, their condemnation is just. What then are we better than they? Not at all. For we previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they're all under sin, as it's written. There is none righteous. No, not one. There is none who understands. There's none who seeks after God. They've all turned aside. They've all together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With the tongues, they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now, we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the time tonight. We pray that we continue to use the time wisely. Father, bless us tonight as we study. We pray that everything we do and say will please you well, bring a smile to your face and honor to your name. Father, we thank you for many who have been ill. Thank, thankfully that Barbara could come back to us and, and Patrick could come back to us, but we pray for Jackie and her, her knee and her calf situation. And Father, there's others that are suffering with allergies. It's allergy season. Father, we just pray for them. And we pray for those still dealing with the COVID. And Father, we, we really have our hearts and minds on brethren in the Ukraine. Father, we just pray that that will be solved peaceably, that you will do as you see fit. And Father, we just pray that you'll forgive us of our sins. Thank you for the one who's changed everything for us, and that is your son. Thank you for the new relationship we have in you. It is in and through the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. And so Paul says, a question, what prophet is circumcision? Now, this has nothing to do with the protests that have been going on. I think it was in El Paso or protests somewhere I was reading. And for some reason, there are some people that are protesting over circumcision. And they're saying things like, you don't have to do that. And, you know, and, and I'm kind of scratching my head because I've never known anybody. Maybe, I've, maybe I'm just naive. I've just never known anybody to be forced into that. Um, there's a lot of benefits, healthier, wait till the eighth day. And that's what the sign was uh, for Abraham. 
wait until the eighth day after the child's born. And that was a sign between Abraham and the Jews. Well, the problem became that the Jews started forcing physically all the requirements of the old law to obtain the blessings of Christ. That's just like mixing gas and, and water. You can't do that. You can't put water in a gasoline engine like I tried to do. We talked about that last week. You can't, you can't sit there and, and expect to obtain the blessings of Christ by following the law of Moses. It doesn't work. But he does say in every way, because at the first, who were the covenant people of God? It was the Jews. It was the Israelites. You go back and you start reading the promise made in Genesis 12, 430 years later to the very day, they are leaving Egypt from the Egyptian captivity on their way to Mount Sinai. 430 years after that, they are no longer the nation that God said they would be because they wouldn't hold up to their end of the bargain. But see, they were given the word of God. This is why Paul says, you better be very careful when you're a mature Christian that we don't make the same mistake these Jews made. Now, I know that it's hard. For example, one guy said, uh, and, and I think about it when my kids correct me about something. That's hard for an adult to take a correction from a kid. But you know what? Sometimes kids write. <laughs> And more times his son was right. I, I didn't say that. Lord, I apologize. Get, yeah, all right. But sometimes it's hard for us to hear that because, you see, we're the adults. We're supposed to be the ones that know. We're supposed to be the ones that are mature. Well, I know some adults that forget it. Their kids are more mature than they are. But the children of Israel wouldn't follow the word of God. They wouldn't follow the law. Matthew 23, I'm, I'm going to refer to that again. He blistered the Jews. I mean, he you talk about nothing politically correct in that. He called them whitewashed tombs. He said, outside, you look great. Inside, you're full of dead men's bones. You see, they should have known. They should have known who Jesus was. That's why. It's, it's hard for me personally to read John 8, 58, when, when, they are, uh, when they're there berating Jesus. And Jesus is talking to them and trying to set them straight. And they turn, he says, before Abraham was, I am this. You're not yet 50 years old. We're Abraham's children. We've never been in bondage to anyone. Really? What happened to the Egyptian bondage? That's the first thing I asked when I got old enough to understand what Jesus was doing. And so they, they would always not recognize who they should have recognized. You know, Caiaphas, for example, he didn't even know he was making a, a prophecy when he said that, that somebody has got to be lifted up for the nation. He prophesied about Jesus. And when you look at the apostle Paul, his name was Saul before Acts 9. I, I think back to, you know, what a radical change that was. He's on his way to Damascus in Acts 9 to arrest men and women who were Christians and take them back to Jerusalem and give them a monkey trial and then stone them to death. And when that bright light happens, he doesn't say, who are you? Acts 9, 4, he says, who are you, Lord? And I don't know what he did when he heard the words, I'm Jesus of Nazareth, whom you persecute. But did it get his attention? Yeah. In fact, when he started preaching, he started preaching for the very one he went to destroy. They had to let him down the wall in a basket to keep him from being killed. And so Paul really is struggling on the one hand with this issue because he's convicting his own physical brethren of sin. 
they're not right with God. He's going to say when we get to chapter 10, oh, they have a zeal. That's just not according to knowledge. I had a student today who fit that category. He said, did you know that the United States is God's nation? I said, no. Do you know Jesus died for everybody? And I said, yes, but that doesn't mean everybody's going to heaven. He said, yeah, it does. I said, no, it doesn't. You have to do things in order to get in contact with Jesus. And he didn't know how to handle that. <laughs> and Paul is in kind of the same predicament here because he's saying he's convicted his brethren of being lost in sin. And that's got to be hard for him because he grew up. And I mean, it was the Jewish way or no way at all. He's of the conservative part of the Jews. That is the Pharisees, Acts 23. And the difference between the Jews or between the Pharisees and the Sadducees was that the Pharisees believed in angels and a resurrection. Sadducees didn't. I don't know how you figure that being a, a person of God and reading the old stories like Samuel coming back with the witch of Endor. I, well, I better not get too far in that, I guess, but there's no advantage to being a Jew. There's nothing wrong with being a Jew, but there's no advantage to being a physical Jew. Because the problem is, folks, we're talking about the physical and the spiritual. The physical is one thing. I have different color skin. I have different colored hair. I have a different type of body. But inwardly, I'm made in the image of God. Guess what? You have a different skin type. You have a different skin color. You have a different hairstyle. You have a different everything. But inwardly, you're still made in the image of God. And so there's no advantage to being a Jew. Now, Paul anticipates what his brethren are going to say oh yes there is we came from jerusalem and we had that temple and we had that temple there but look at what he says in chapter three verse number four certainly not i don't like that i like the king james version god forbid Indeed, let God be what? True. And every man a what? Liar. Psalm 51, 4, that you may be justified in your words and you may overcome when you judge. Now, that's pretty, that's just setting the record straight here. I'm sorry, Job 40, verse 8. I said Psalm 51, 4, and I didn't put it in the notes. Job 40, verse 8. Sorry. That you may be justified when you judge. I was watching a YouTube thing, and this, uh, I think she was about 19 years old. And she was arrested for DWI. And so she's sitting in jail and the judge tells her she's going to serve, I think it was 30 days in the uh, county detention center. And she said, whatever. And she walked off. And he goes, come back, young lady. He said, what was that you said to me? She said, whatever. He said, we're going to send you 45 days in jail. And she says, huh. And turn around while he said, come back, young lady. And he said, we're going to put you in lockup 60 days. And she went. And she went to leave the place thinking that the judge wasn't serious. I was like, how? How ignorant can you be? This judge is going to send you to jail for 60 days. And you have the audacity to talk to the judge that way? Well, same thing here. God's always right. God's always right. And so he asked two questions. 
Number one, is God unjust who inflicts wrath? You talk to some people and they'll tell you, yeah. God had no business. God had no business kicking Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden. That was cruel. God had no business raining fire and brimstone down on Sodom and Gomorrah. God had no business taking that baby from David and Bathsheba when David and Bathsheba sinned. That's just cruel. And God had the audacity to swallow or open up the earth and swallow and, and kill and kill 250 people from Korah when they rebelled against Moses and God. Now, I hope what you heard was I said the words, but none of it's true. And the reason none of it's true is because we've got to understand the nature of God. The nature of God is he's got a system of justice. It's perfect justice. I'm still trying to figure out, and every time I go down there to uh, downtown right near what we call affectionately in our family, Plisco's, that's Jalisco's. It's a restaurant downtown if you're watching online. And... I'm getting ready to pull out and I look back and I look back and I look back three times and all of a sudden I turn my car to make a U-turn and there's a van. And I just went down the side of this van. And so I, they called the cops and that's okay. That's the rules. That's the law. And I saw Judge Rudy. Now I know him personally. We, we affectionately called him Judge Judy. He was one of my, uh, one, he was my babysitter's brother. And uh, he'd just laugh about it. And he says, I vaguely remember you being in front of me and I paid my fine and whatever. Well, what I found frustrating was is that you'd have other people who were speeding, who were doing what I consider worse offenses. You know what, Judge, if I don't do anything within 90 days, will you drop the charges? Why didn't I think of that? <laughs> but I couldn't say to Judge Rudy that, um, and he asked me, he said, how do you plead? I said, well, I'd prefer to plead no contest. I said, I, I, I don't know what else to do. And he said, well, that's fine. He's very nice about it. And, and I think it cost me 60 bucks, I think, because of the court cost and, and all. But I was trying to explain to him, I looked three times behind me. I looked all over and I don't know where that van came, that vehicle came from. I have no idea where that vehicle came from. And Adele and I were talking about it one time and she said the same thing. But I couldn't stand there before Judge Rudy and say, or sit there before Judge Rudy in his office and say, you know what? That's unfair. Because I pulled out in front of somebody. Well, mankind has not done what God said to do. They've disobeyed God. That's what happened in Sodom and Gore. He couldn't find 10 righteous people in the whole place. And they were doing the things that this student asked me about. And God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. He said, you'll never find them. We have archaeologists that think they found it. But just like Nineveh, you're not going to find it because God said you won't find it. How about Moses when he spent all that time being loyal to God, faithful to God? Come on, God. He got mad and he struck the rock twice. Why'd you, why'd you not let him go to the promised land? Because God's got a system of justice. In fact, when Moses politely asked three times for God to change his mind, God finally said, Moses, don't you bring this up again. I've made up my mind. But he let him see it. And so the second question he's got is, has is, is Israel canceled God's promises? I mean, just because he's a God of wrath doesn't mean he's not a God of promise. God forbid. He's made several promises. In fact, Peter called them exceedingly great and precious promises. And when people tell me, that the promises of God are unconditional. And I heard somebody say that the other day. That's not true. 
Don't let anybody tell you the promises of God are, are, un, are unconditional. The promises of God are always conditional. When he told Solomon, 1 Kings 3, you're going to be the wisest man in the world because you didn't ask for it. I'm going to give you more wealth than anybody you, has ever existed on the earth or will ever exist on the earth. But you have to remain faithful to me. When Daniel was in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were serving in, in Nebuchadnezzar's court, the command back in 1 Kings 21 was they had to look back toward Jerusalem. And so when Darius, I said Nebuchadnezzar's court, I meant Darius's court. When he knew, the, he knew or Daniel knew that, that the decree was signed that if anybody prays to any other God but the God of the Persians for 30 days, they'd be thrown in the lion's den. Text says he knew the decree was signed. What did he do? He went to his room and prayed three times that day, as was his custom. Darius tried to get out of it. They said, the, no, it's already a sealed deal. The law of the Persians put him in, in the lion's den. And Darius wouldn't sleep. He wouldn't eat. He wouldn't let anybody put him to sleep. Very early in the morning, he goes to the mouth of the cave. And he says, oh, Daniel, has, the God, has your God delivered you? Much to the relief of Darius, he hears, O king, live forever. The God I serve has stopped the mouths of the lions. So the promises of God haven't been made of no effect, the King James, New King James said. But here's a question that, that comes up. And he's going to address this in chapter 5 and verse 20. Well, can we, uh, the, the thing that we need to understand, and this is going to be so hard for me, if it isn't you, great, but it's going to be so hard for me to get, and, and I, I spent a lot of time on this a few weeks ago, because it is so hard for me to wrap my heads around the fact that grace always is greater than sin. The reason is, is because I'm so used to being punished and disciplined when I'm wrong, and I should be. You know, when, when I get something wrong, um, I should be punished. Maybe you saw the TikTok thing the other day. I was telling Adele about it, and this guy and his wife, are, you can tell they're not getting along about something. And all of a sudden, he pulls out this long piece of paper, and he's got it on the counter, and he's doing this. And then he does this. And she says, why are you looking at our marriage certificate? He says, I'm looking for the expiration date. And that's when the fight started. There are a lot of people that would just think that grace is not greater than sin because they're so used to being in trouble when they've done wrong. Now, that obviously was a joke. And I know they set that up. But the question comes up, if the grace of God is greater than sin, why can't we just continue living in sin? I mean, why can't we just say that we just will do whatever we want, whatever we wish, whatever we please, and, and God won't hold us accountable for anything. One denomination teaches that. Now, they have changed the way they address it but it but i will tell you i wish that doctrine was true the doctrine of once you're saved you're always saved you know kevin fox used to be here and he lives in north texas but he told me he says wouldn't you like for that to be true Dwayne?" i said boy would i ever that i don't have to do anything that all I have to say is I just believe. And I don't have to obey. I don't have to do any of that. And the grace of God is just going to be that blank check that covers everything. And Paul says, no, that's not the truth. Because he's going to say in chapter 6, in verse 1 and 2, how shall we who died to sin 
live any longer in it. And I have a lesson in my library that I was very honored that a experienced preacher used. He said, man, that's good stuff. He said, we better die. That's the title of the lesson. We better die because you can't live in sin and be pleasing to God. You just can't because God turns away from that. And I, I always liked the illustration that I, I didn't appreciate, appreciate the dream at the time, but uh, my, my uh, great aunt, bless her, sometimes she was vain. Loved her to death, but she was just sometimes vain. So my uncle, great uncle Rufus, who was a wonderful man, he couldn't come to church very often. He had wrinkles real bad. And, and most of the time he'd come to church on Sunday night and four men would have to carry him out. They didn't have him for some reason. They never got him a wheelchair. I don't know. He could walk in, but he couldn't walk out. Maybe he was stubborn about getting one. I don't know. So, but we'd visit and he would be so pleasant and he'd be so... You know, he just, everybody just loved Rufus. And Rufus, Uncle Rufus died. When he died, we were just kind of waiting around for, you know, when the funeral's going to be. And in my hometown, you didn't, you don't necessarily have a visitation. They just have the body there and they, you know, you can come up anytime you want to. So, so anyhow, we went up to the funeral home and, and uh, went to see him, and I almost ran out the door. And the reason is because they'd taken his wrinkles, and he was so smooth-skinned, I didn't even know who it was. I had to go back and look at pictures that uh, Granny and Donna had to make sure that was really him. But I guess it traumatized me so much, I had a dream. The dream I had was he came out of that casket during his funeral. And I'm petrified beyond belief. The only three people that stayed in the building were me and the funeral director and his wife. And he's walking back there and I'm so petrified in fear, I don't even walk out the door, but he's trying to talk, you know, his mouth's been glued shut. Uh, or so I thought anyway, and, 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 and he can't open his eyes, but I thought his eyes were glued shut too. And, and it was like, when I woke up, I'm like, man, I'm glad that was a dream. Because when we went to the funeral, he didn't get out of that casket. He didn't get out of it. When we, when they took him to the front back to show, have a viewing one last time, he didn't get out of there. He was dead. That's what Paul says we are, dead to sin. You can't live any longer in it. And so the grace of God is always greater than sin. And we're all sinners. And we all need the grace of God. And we all need the same play, a same person. And that's why Paul would say both Jews and Gentiles are all under sin. You might want to add this in your notes to Galatians 3.22. Paul said, God has included, God has subjected all under sin. The reason? So everybody can be saved. Now, that doesn't mean you're automatically saved. But all can have the same opportunity. You see, it's not God who wants people to go to hell. I have a lot of friends that still think that. And you can try to show them the scripture. You can talk to till you're blue in the face. And they still think God wants them to go to hell. It doesn't matter if they read 1 Timothy 2, 3 through 5. It doesn't matter if they read 2 Peter 3, 9. They just think God hates them. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. And so what does he say here? He says the verdict that both Jews and Gentiles are under is by the behavior. That's what we mean, manifestation, what is shown in front of people in human character. And he quotes here, 
from Psalm 14, the first three verses, and Psalm 53, the first three verses. And it's simply, let me just remind you, there is none, and this goes with Psalm 3 as well. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none who understands. There's none who seeks after God. They've all turned aside. They've together become unprofitable. There's none who does good, no, not one. Student, that same student I was telling you about a few minutes ago, he says, he, he, he said something about good and bad people. And I said, there'll be more bad people in heaven than there will be good people. What? There'll be more bad people than there will be good people. Here's why. There's nobody good. Now, I know that burst in somebody's bubble somewhere along the lines, but you're not any good. I'm not any good. And the reason I'm not any good is because look at what we're under. We're all under sin. Verse 13, their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues, they practice deceit. The poison of asps, the poison of snakes, is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. Now, that one right there in verse 17 just blows me away. They haven't known peace. I liked what somebody put on uh, Facebook. You know, about the time I'm complaining about having to get up in the morning and go to work, or about the time I'm complaining about, you know, didn't have this or this and this, I think I didn't wake up to a bomb hitting my house this morning. I didn't wake up to sirens of invasion. See, I don't live in the Ukraine. Can you imagine sleeping in your own house, minding your own business, and you get awakened about three, four o'clock in the morning with a bomb coming in your house? That doctor on the Today Show said when they asked about Putin that he's not hitting civilians, that doctor said he's a liar. He said, that's all this is, is civilian people in this ICU unit. You see, Jesus said it like this. Don't, don't let wolves deceive you by what they say. He said, because what, what eventually happens, you know them by their character. And so the manifestation of sin is in human character. But the second part of this is in verse 13 to 18, and that is, the verdict proved. The verdict has been proved. The verdict that all are under sin, that all are guilty, has been proven by the manifestation of sin in human conduct. Look at verse, look at verse uh, uh, 19. We know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become what? Guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh, no human being, no, that is no physical, no physical gift will make someone right before God because the law gave knowledge about sin. And so the result of sin, it's in four things, destruction and misery. James says it another way. He just said it in James chapter one, that sin leads to destruction. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Sin leads by deception. It leads it continues in destruction, and eventually it leads to death. And nobody wants to be separated 
from God. We've seen the pictures on the border. We've seen the pictures and, and video in Ukraine. Whether or not you feel, how you feel about the immigration situation, that's immaterial. You imagine having to give your children to someone you don't know or having to, to let your children go to where you don't know they're going. My family gets on my case because I panic. Somebody's about two minutes late and I'm already calling on the phone. Where are you? Well, why are you worried about me? Because I love you. Come on. Destruction and misery. Number two, peace, contentment, and joy. Had a, an anomaly happen today. We're in seventh period computer graphics class, and I've never heard my classroom that quiet all year long. In fact, one of the students came in about 10, 15, 20 minutes into class. She says, Mr. And she's real kind of hushed, hush, which they could talk. I, I didn't have any problem with that. She said, Mr., I haven't heard it this quiet in your room all year. Oh, yeah, he so-and-so's gone. We all busted out laughing because we knew who the source was. And the thing is, when you don't know peace or contentment, you don't really recognize them as you should. But once you got a hold of it and you lose it, it is definitely heartbreaking. But that third one, peace, contentment, and joy. This is what I struggle with. Oh, I'm joyous in the Lord, but I'm not always joyous. Um, give you an example. Here I am looking forward to, to going home, getting home and sitting down for a few minutes and then we'll get supper and then we'll, then we'll get over here and do what we, we need to do. We need to have another meeting after school. I just went like this. Oh! Why do they put these meetings on Wednesday? <laughs> I wouldn't mind a meeting on Thursday, wouldn't mind a meeting on Tuesday. In fact, I didn't mind one we had on Monday. And we had one, uh, yeah, we had one Monday, which was cool. I didn't like the subject, but okay, that's neither here nor there. Peace, contentment, and joy. They leave the center. They don't even, they don't even go near the center. And number three, the source of sin is not fearing God. You see, that's the other part of verse 20, that I, uh, verse 19. Now, we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the, guilt, all the world may become guilty before God. Look at verse 18. There's no fear of God before their eyes. No fear of God before their eyes. Somebody asked me one time, me and a friend, excuse me, when Mike Tyson was really big into boxing, would you get in the ring with Mike Tyson? Sure would. Are you crazy? He'd kill you. I said, yeah, he would probably. In fact, I probably would just lay down and pretend I got hit. They said, why in the world would you get in the ring with Mike Tyson? I said, you know what the loser of that boxing match got the other day? And this is back in the 80s and 90s. $7.5 million. Bless you. $7.5 million. And then this person said that I was crazy. He said, you know what? Maybe I better think about that again. <laughs> There's no fear of God. Mike Tyson's got nothing on God. He's got nothing on God. The scariest dream I've ever had in my life is it was judgment day. And I wasn't ready. And for some reason, Moses and Aaron were flying around and leading everybody to, to the throne. I don't know where I got that, but, but I knew I wasn't right. 
I knew it wasn't right with the Lord. Thank God I fixed that. Because the source of sin is not fearing God. I, I'm more fearful of what somebody says. For example, uh, the other day I had this funeral and I've got my Bible. A friend of mine gives me a hard time. She says, you mean you, you use the Bible? I said, honey, I use the Bible. And about 99% of people I know don't. <laughs> I use the Bible all the time. Where do you think I come up with Hebrews 9, 27? It's appointed for men to die once. And after this comes the judgment. Now, that last one is almost going to look confusing. Because we have a law. We have a law. But this almost reminds you of what Bugs Bunny would do in his cartoon. Bugs is, I think he's fighting with Yosemite Sam. And Bugs is standing there on, on the cliff. And he goes out across the cliff and he doesn't fall, he stands. Well, Yosemite Sam falls. And he turns around and looks at the camera and he says, it's a good thing I haven't learned about gravity yet. Now, we know that's crazy, because even if you hadn't studied gravity, you know what you're going to do. But Paul says that's the way sin is. When you don't have the law, there is no sin. When you don't have a law, there is no sin. Under the law of Moses, which the Jews had to live, they had to live it perfectly. If you stand in one part of the law, you stand in all of it. We're now under the perfect law of liberty. Almost sounds oxymoronic, doesn't it? How can you have a law and be free the same way we do today? What, how fast are you supposed to drive here? 35 miles an hour. When are you supposed to pay your taxes? I didn't ask if you liked it. When are you supposed to, when's the deadline? April 15th. When, when, when uh, or how can you vote? You got to go to the county clerk's office and register to vote. Once you do that, you get you get to vote. You go in there and tell them your name, sign sign the little doohickey, and go in and vote. It's a law, but it makes us free. It's a law, but it makes us free. That's the way this works here. And so the law talks to those who are under the law so that the mouth of everyone can be stopped. All the world may be guilty before God. And by the deeds of the law, no one physical will be declared. In, in other words, if you're just a Jew, just because you're a Jew physically does not make you right with God. Just because I'm a Gentile doesn't make me right with God. When the law brought in the reality of sin, the great news was, verse 20, therefore by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Verse 21 will give you a sneak peek, of, sneak peek of next week's lesson, and that is, but now, how to be right with God is revealed. Hot dog, how do I get right with God? He tells us right here, folks. He tells us in this book. And I love what somebody said. I think it's Phil Sanders said at Palm Beach Lakes. He says, the Bible's not hard. He said, oh, there's things in it that, yeah, you, you might not completely understand the first time you read it and study it. He said, but the Bible's not hard. And you listen to their website on the, uh, or listen to their YouTube channel, and you listen to Dan Jenkins, who's preached there for about 40 years, ask the kids questions, who built the ark? Noah. Who, how many animals went in the ark? Two by two. I mean, it's, they're asking questions and they're answering them. These are little kids. Anybody can understand the Bible. You just got to take the time to open it. And if need be, find somebody who knows it and ask questions. I like, and I know this may make some people mad. I hope it doesn't. But I liked 
so much what I saw on a Masonic shirt from a Mason. And that is to be one, ask one. And it wasn't the TWO, it was the number two, then it had a B, and then it had a one. Ask one. You want to know how to be a Christian? Ask us. We'd love to tell you. But you got to be one to be right with God. And that's the universality of Romans 1, 16 and 17. It's for everybody. That's the wonderful part about this. It's for everybody. Anything you wanted to add to that tonight? Thank you all for being here. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the time tonight. We pray that we've used it wisely. And Father, we realize that no matter who we are, we're sinners who need to be saved by the grace of God. And without it, and without your demonstration of love, there is no salvation. We thank you so much, Father, that you devised the plan before we were created and before time started so that we could have the, not only the forgiveness of sins, but the hope of eternal life knowing that he's not left in a tomb. He's been raised the third day, not to set up a kingdom, but that kingdom's already in existence. And Father, we just pray tonight that we can access that, that one thing that he lives to make for us, and that's intercession. Father, we can't come to you without him, our high priest. And Father, we ask for the forgiveness of our sins. We ask for the protection that you've promised. We ask for your blessings and your continued blessings, to be honest. Thank you for all of them, Father. And it's in Jesus that we pray. Amen. Again, thank you all for being here.